On October 19, 1959, a brand new Boeing 707-227 prepared for a critical demonstration flight over the skies of Washington State. Built for Braniff International Airways, the aircraft was moments away from being handed over. But first, it had to pass one final test. Aboard were Boeing test pilots, Braniff's own captains, engineers, and federal inspectors, all tasked with evaluating the plane's handling under controlled conditions. What was meant to be a routine acceptance flight quickly escalated into an unfolding nightmare. Within hours, the aircraft would suffer catastrophic structural failures midair, shedding three of its four engines, leaving the pilots with a crippled machine, barely controllable, and on a desperate search for somewhere to land. The incident would not only claim lives, but force a reckoning within Boeing and the aviation industry about training procedures, aircraft design, and the dangers of exceeding operational limits. Lessons that would reshape the future of commercial flight. This is Inside Aero Disaster, the story of the Boeing 707 Braniff test flight that lost its engines midair. The Boeing 707 involved in the incident was a 707-227 model, registered as N7071, freshly built and barely four months old. By the morning of October 19, 1959, it had accumulated just 173 flight hours. Powered by four Pratt and Whitney JT-4A engines, it represented the cutting edge of commercial aviation, a sleek, long-range jetliner designed to propel air travel into a new era. That day, the aircraft was scheduled for a combined customer guarantee demonstration and pilot acceptance training flight. Boeing routinely offered these sessions for airline customers, providing hands-on experience before official delivery. The mission profile for this flight was simple. Demonstrate the aircraft's capabilities and train Braniff International Airways pilots in recovery techniques from typical in-flight situations. On board were eight men, four flight crew members, and four observers. Boeing test pilot Russell Baum, 32 years old, served as the instructor. Though relatively young, Baum had logged over 5,000 flight hours and was deeply familiar with Boeing's new jet. Beside him sat Captain John Burke, 49, a Braniff pilot with over 23,500 hours of flying experience, though little of it on jet aircraft. Captain Frank Staley Jr., 43, another Braniff captain with over 20,000 flight hours, occupied a jump seat to observe. Flight engineer George Hagen, 28, managed aircraft systems and monitoring. Among the observers were maintenance engineers, a second test pilot, and a Federal Aviation Administration FAA inspector. At 2.51 p.m. local time, after standard pre-flight checks and clearances, the aircraft lifted off from Boeing Field in Seattle. The plan was to climb to a safe altitude, perform basic maneuvers, and replicate emergency procedures, standard practice to validate both the aircraft and the pilot training. What none of the experienced men on board could foresee, however, was that within a few hours, small procedural deviations and human error would escalate into structural disaster, exposing critical weaknesses that no checklist could fix. At cruising altitude, the training exercises commenced. Boeing test pilot Russell Baum initiated a series of demonstration maneuvers designed to showcase the 707's stability and recovery capabilities. The first phase involved Dutch roll demonstrations, a lateral motion where the aircraft yaws and rolls in a synchronized pattern common in swept-wing jetliners. The goal was to train the Braniff pilots to recognize and correct such motions using proper control inputs. Initially, Baum conducted the exercises from the right seat, guiding the aircraft through moderate Dutch rolls with the wings banked within Boeing's maximum allowed limit of 25 degrees. Captain Burke, occupying the left seat, was then tasked with replicating these recoveries under Baum's supervision. The exercises proceeded without incident until Baum proposed switching seats with Burke. Now in command from the left seat, Baum prepared for another round of Dutch roll maneuvers, but this time he approached them with increased aggression. Bank angles grew sharper, exceeding 40 degrees, and at times nearing 60, far beyond the certified limits for safe demonstration, an engineer riding as an observer reminded Baum of the limitations, but the warnings went unheeded. Eager to showcase the aircraft's capabilities, or perhaps overly confident in its resilience, 
Baum pushed the 707 into oscillations that subjected the airframe to forces it was never designed to endure during routine operations. In one critical sequence, Burke, still adjusting to the 707's handling characteristics, attempted to recover from an aggressive Dutch roll. Misjudging the dynamics, he applied a recovery input just as the aircraft's natural oscillation reached its peak. The result was catastrophic. The 707 rolled sharply to the right, passing 90 degrees, nearly turning belly up. Baum immediately seized control, applying full opposite aileron to arrest the roll. For a moment it worked. The aircraft leveled off, its descent halted. It seemed the crisis had been narrowly averted. But hidden within the aircraft's wings, structural damage had already begun. Damage that would soon manifest in a way no one on board could survive unscathed. Seconds after the violent roll recovery, the first signs of deeper failure emerged. Warning lights illuminated in the cockpit, signaling loss of thrust in three engines. Almost simultaneously, electrical systems began to fail, cutting off crucial support systems mid-flight. Behind the cockpit, a glance out the windows confirmed the growing catastrophe. Three of the Boeing 707's four engines, along with their pylons, had detached from the wings entirely. Flames licked the exposed fuel lines where the engines had once been mounted. Only engine number three, mounted inboard on the right wing, remained in place and operational. The violent forces during the extreme Dutch roll maneuver had exceeded the structural tolerance of the engine pylons. The oscillations had generated stresses far beyond the design limits, tearing the mounts away and triggering fuel leaks and fires on the damaged wing sections. Inside the cockpit, the flight crew was facing an unprecedented crisis. With massive asymmetrical thrust loss and aerodynamic imbalance, the 707's remaining control authority was severely compromised. In addition, the fire damage had destroyed parts of the left wing's ailerons and fueled instability across the airframe. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Boeing pilot Baum elected to shut down the single remaining engine. The move was desperate but logical. Removing thrust could temporarily counteract the uncontrolled roll caused by asymmetrical drag and thrust forces. Now powerless, the aircraft entered a dead stick glide, silent except for the wind tearing past its damaged structure, descending steadily toward the rural terrain below. Yet even without engine power, the fire continued to compromise the aircraft's wing structure. Every second in the air narrowed the chances of a survivable landing. With thrust eliminated and structural fire spreading, Baum maneuvered the crippled Boeing 707 toward the most viable option, an open pasture near the farming community of Oso, Washington. Altitude was limited, systems were degraded, and wing integrity was rapidly declining. Gliding silently, the aircraft descended with minimal control surfaces remaining. Only partial right aileron and rudder inputs were available. Much of the left wing's control authority had been destroyed by fire. As the aircraft neared treetop level, maintaining lateral stability became nearly impossible. At approximately 110 feet above ground, the left wing, weakened by fire and missing structural mass from the detached engine pylons, struck the tops of tall trees. The collision sheared off a significant portion of the wing, instantly disrupting whatever limited lift the aircraft had left. The Boeing 707 banged violently leftward, its nose dropping uncontrollably. Within seconds, the fuselage slammed into the ground near the Stillaguamish River, fracturing on impact. The forward section, including the cockpit, crumpled and ignited as jet fuel spilled and ignited, consuming the front half of the aircraft in fire. The tail section, however, broke away during the initial impact and came to rest upright in the shallow river. Remarkably, four passengers who had relocated to the rear cabin before the crash survived, escaping with minor injuries by crawling from the wreckage into the river. The forward crew, Baum, Burke, Staley, and Hagen, had no chance. The combined forces of the impact and post-crash fire made survival impossible in the front section. By the time local residents arrived, Flames engulfed most of the fuselage. Recovery operations would take hours, and the full extent of the mechanical failure was only beginning to be understood. In the immediate aftermath, recovery teams focused on locating the engines, recording structural damage, and interviewing the surviving passengers. Three engines were found scattered across miles of dense forest, their pylons still partially attached, indicating they had separated mid-flight under extreme stress. 
not upon ground impact. The Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB, responsible for the investigation, quickly identified the primary failure, structural overload of the engine pylons. Detailed analysis confirmed that the oscillations during the aggressive Dutch roll maneuvers had imposed forces far beyond the design tolerances of the wing-mounted structures. The pylon separations had initiated once the stress thresholds were breached, setting off a chain reaction of fire, control loss, and eventual crash. Investigators also noted that no mechanical fault or engine failure occurred prior to the structural failures. The engines themselves were operational until forcibly torn from their mounts. Furthermore, the aircraft's flight data recorder, although installed, had not been activated for this training flight, depriving investigators of direct flight metrics. The CAB's final report concluded that the probable cause of the accident was the improper execution of high-angle Dutch roll maneuvers compounded by an inexperienced recovery attempt. There had been no instructional necessity to exceed Boeing's maximum bank angle limits during the exercise. The over-enthusiastic demonstration, intended to showcase performance, had instead exposed a critical vulnerability in extreme conditions. As a direct result of the findings, Boeing revised its pilot training programs to emphasize strict adherence to maneuvering limits. Design modifications also followed, including increasing the size of the vertical stabilizer and ensuring permanent hydraulic boost to the rudder, both of which would enhance lateral stability during unusual attitude recoveries. The crash of N7071 became a pivotal moment in the evolution of test flight safety, a stark reminder that even small deviations from procedure can yield catastrophic consequences in aviation. If you found this story as shocking and thought-provoking as we did, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more real-life aviation investigations. Stay tuned for more Inside Aero Disaster Stories. Until next time, stay safe. And remember, in aviation, safety is never a given.